Good afternoon to everyone. We can start this uh, sure. The title is Dialogues between Economics and Physics, Uncertainty and Chaotic Behaviors. Can a scientific method be applied in a non-ergodic world or economics in a real science? The speaker. Uh, Professor Tarcisio Mariano, Marziano, sorry, for the Institute of uh, Physics of this uh, university. I'm very glad to, uh, to present to you, and uh, after the discussion, it will be Jose Luis Oreiro, that anyone. Oh? Okay. You want to uh, start? Oh, okay. You are the, the boss, please. Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a very provocative uh, session on this workshop. Um, my presentation is the title of um, the section Uncertainty and Chaotic Behavior Can Scientific Method Be Applied in a Non Ergotic Word? Um, let me start with Joe Mary Kane's quotes. Uh, John Mary Keynes, uh, born in 1883 and, and dead in 1946, replied to Hoy Howard's lecture, The Scope and Method in Economics, pub published in 1938, uh, this way, Keynes' words. Economics is a science of thinking in terms of models, joined to the art of choosing models, which are relevant to the contemporary world. It is compelled to be this because, unlike the typical natural science, the material to which is applied is, in too many respects, not homogeneous through time. The object of a model is to segregate the semi-permanent or relative constant factors from those which are transitory or fluctuating, so as to develop a logical way of thinking about the later and of understanding the main sequences to which they give rise in particular cases. Good economists are scarce because the gift for using vigilant observation to choose good models, although it does not require a higher speciali specialized intellectual technique, appears to be a very hair one. In the second phase, place, economics is essentially a moral and a not a natural science. It is to say it employs introspection and judgments of value. I, want, I also want to emphasize strongly the point about economics being a moral science. I mentioned before that it deals with introspection and with values. I might have added that it deals with motives, expectations, psychological uncertainties, or has to be constantly on guard against treating the material as constant and homogeneous in the sense, in the same way that the material of other sciences is, in spite of its complexity, be constant and homogeneous. Well, so to discuss if economics is a science or not, as you can uh, observe, Keynes think that economics is a moral science, not a natural science, we have to discuss what is precisely the scientific method. The scientific method is an empirical method for acquire, acquiring knowledge that characterizes the development of science since at least the 17th century. The scientific method involves careful observation uh, coupled with rigorous skepticism because uh, cognitive assumptions can distort the interpretation of the observation. Scientific inquiry, including 
creating a hypothesis through inductive reasoning, testing it in experiments and statistical analysis, and adjusting or discarding that hypothesis based on the results. Although procedures vary from one field of inquiry to another, the underlying process is often similar. The process in the scientific method involves making conjectures, that is, hypothetical explanations, deriving predictions from the hypothesis as logical consequences, and then carry out experiments on empirical observation based on these predictions. A hypothesis is a conjecture based on knowledge obtained while seeking answers to the question. The hypothesis may be, may, might be very specific or it might be broad. Scientists then test hypotheses by conducting experiments or studies. A scientific hypothesis is a very important thing, must be falsifiable, implying that it's possible to identify a possible outcome of, of an experiment or observation that conflicts with pre predictions deduced from the hypothesis. Otherwise, okay. Well, in economics, how is the process of learning, of acquiring knowledge? There are two learning models in economics. The learning, just a moment. Better this way. The learning of economic theory has been carried out under two distinct models. The first one is the hard science model, is the model of physics. The student must immediately become acquainted with the current stage of the theory. The second model is the soft science. The student must become familiar with the classics of the past, even if to the, to, to the detriment of the more recent developments of the theory. The two models reflect different conceptions about the evolution of economic theory. Underlying the hard science model is the idea of the frontier of knowledge. The student would not waste time with the classics of the past because all his eventual contributions have already been incorporated into the current state of the theory. Underlying the soft science model is the idea of historically dispersed knowledge in a such a way that the student should dedicate himself to the classics because he would, no he would need to, to tread his own to the fundamental matri matrix of the theory. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, what is the concept of frontier of knowledge? This notion comes from ex exact sciences like physics. In this field, the important contributions of the past are incorporated into the present state of science. The rest consists of misconception of the past which can be largely ignored without great loss from the point of view of the advancement of science. Learning makes place on, this, on the basis of textbooks. In this conception of, of science, the history of economic thought can be summed up in the historiography of economist, economist errors and anticipations. Errors, when the doctrine that was presumed to be true in the past diverts from which, from that which is part of the current state of theory, the past diverges from that which is part of the current state of theory, anticipations when it prefigures the both. The soft, soft science model, the model, the soft science model ignores the notion of frontier of knowledge. It assumes that the basic matrix of economic theory are 
of problematic reconciliation and are untranslatable into their original force. Uh, and this model has two basic assumptions. The first one is the assumption of problematic reconciliation. What is this assumption? The idea that the basic matrix of economic theory, because they, they structure comprehensive views of economic world, hardly admit murders or synthesis. The second assumption is the assumption of non-translation. It is impossible to transcribe the basic matrix without the basic laws of understanding. For example, there would be no better way to understand the Marxist matrix, see you, see Adomir, without, uh, uh, then through the reading of capital in German. Okay? The learning of economic theory necessarily involves the study of the history of economic thought. Well, the next issue is how we in economics solve controversies. How is the uh, dispute re resolution? The existence or not of a frontier of knowledge depends on the way in which disputes are resolved. Implicit in the notion of the frontier of thought is the notion of positive overcoming of controversies. By positive overcoming, we mean that the resolution of controversies brings out, in, out their truth and that this truth is accepted by all participants in the controversy and is incorporated into the current state of science. Positive or overcoming, however, is the exception, not the rule in economic theory. There are a lot of examples of controversies that are only partially resolved in the sense that their, their resolution did not generate consensual responses among all participants. There are controversies that end up to fatigue or lack of interest on the part of the participants. For instance, the famous uh, Keynes and the Classics uh, debate from 1937 to 1939 is exactly an example of a controversy that ends because the, both sides are tired to try to convince the other that the other part is wrong. Sometimes the controversy ends without generating an ambiguous truth. Other controversies change their meaning when resolved. Finally, opposing doctrines coexist for very long periods of time. As we can see, I, I, I show two examples of, uh, of the cyclical path of ideas in economics. In the 70s, Robert Lucas and the neoclassical economists said that Joe Mary Keynes is dead, macroeconomics is dead. I saw, personally, myself, uh, Robert Lucas at the meeting of Ampeki in Florianopolis, 1994, whose lecture uh, was named The End of Macroeconomics. The macroeconomics was created by Keynes. So, in 1994, Lucas can shout to the world that macroeconomics is dead, Keynes is dead, now we have another story. Well, after the 2008 financial crisis, Lord Skidelsky, which is the greatest biographer of John Maynard Keynes, write a book in, 19, in 2009 uh, named Keynes, The Return of the Master. It's, it looks like to Star Wars, you know, The Return of Jedi. And, but this one of John Itwell, which is also a lord, uh, and more, well, one, one of the uh, good things to be an English Keynesian economist, English is important, is that you have a good chance to become a lord. Okay? But uh, uh, Skidowski is a lord, uh, John Whitwell is a lord, both of them barons. But John Whitwell and Moro, Moro Milgate uh, write this book in 2011 called The Fall and Rise of Keynesian Economics. You see, on the, the, the hardcover is the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cover. 
So we in economics had this phenomenon of resurrection of dead thinkers. Time to time. Okay. Well, now the second part of my, of my speech. No ergotic environment uncertainty and learning in, in economics. In the mainstream view of economics as a science, uh, economic observations are postulated to be part of time series realizations generated by stochastic process, which are assumed to be ergotic. The Nobel Paul Samuelson has made the acceptance of the so-called ergotic hypothesis the sine qua non of the scientific method in economics. Cons cons consequently, the orthodox concept of science, economic, scientific economic knowledge about the future relationship among observ observable economic variables is defined in terms of probability distribution functions and statistical average generated by ergotic process. All stochastic process generates time series data, which is called the realization of the stochastic process, which can be used to form average. This average, for instance, mean, standard deviation, so on and so forth, form the basis of empirical knowledge about our past and the current real world relationship. Time average refer to average calculated from a single realization over any period of calendar time. Space averages, on the other hand, are statistical averages formed from a universe of realizations observed at a fixed point in, of time, estimates from cross-sectional data, for instance. If the stochastic process which de generates the realization is ergonomic, and for infinite realizations, the space average and the time average will coincide. For finite realizations, the calculated space and time average may differ only to, un to sampling error, but they will tend to converge with probability of equals to one as the member number of observations increase. In the case of ergotic process, therefore, the probability distribution of the relevant variables calculated from any past realization tends to converge with the probability function governing the current events and with the probability functions that will govern future economic outcomes. What is in the implications of such kind of assumptions? In the economic world, entirely by ergotic for economic relationships among variables are timeless, historic in the sense that the future is merely a statistical reflection of the past. The historical dates when the observations are collected does not affect the estimates of the statistical averages. The accumulation of past evidence regarding economic outcomes allows the calculation of statistical average, which can then be used to make statistical, statistically reliable statements regarding the mathematical risk or probability of events occurring in the future. In other words, in an ergotic environment, knowledge about the future involves the projecting of statistical average based on past and all current realizations to forecoming events. In a stochastic world, therefore, uncertainty is defined in terms of the existence of non-ergotic process. More generally, in a world where economic observations need not to be generated by any stochastic process, uncertainty about future relationships can be defined in terms of the absence of governing ergotic process. If economic observations are generated in non-ergotic circumstances, then the calculation of either time and or space average based on past data cannot be expected 
to provide a statistically reliable estimate of either one, the current space average, or two, any time or space average that will be observed over future calendar time. Nor can any currently estimated space average provide reliable estimates of future time or space averages. In other words, in a non ergodic environment, past observations do not produce knowledge regarding current and all future events, while current observation of events provides no statistically credible estimate of future time and or space average. In the real world, some economic process may be ergotic, at least for short periods of time, while others are not. The problem faced every economic decision maker is to determine whether one, the phenomena observed, involved, is currently being governed by the distribution functions, which are sufficiently time invariant to be presumed ergotic, or at least for the relevant future, or no ergotic circumstances are involved. If the fall follows that in a no ergotic world, the future is uncertain in the sense that history and current events cannot provide a reliable statistical guide to knowledge about future outcomes. In a no ergotic environment, people do not know what is going to happen and know that they do not know just what is going to happen as in history. This quote is from the Nobel laureate John Hicks from his book, 1977. Well, what does this stuff have to be with decision, actual decision made by actual people? But, well, here is important to define uh, the concept of crucial decision. A crucial decision is a decision that once is taken, change in a non-reversible way the original environment in which the decision maker had taken it, making the repetition of the decision impossible or highly costly. Some examples, investment in capital assets, uh, research and development expenditures, marriage, uh, the, uh, or the, the Battle of Waterloo. This, that was the, the preferred example of George Chaco. Uh, when George Rucker was the economist that defined the, 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 the concept of uh, crucial decision. Uh, uh, for Chaco, the Battle of Waterloo was a uh, crucial decision because if, if Bonaparte had won the, the Battle of Waterloo, uh, the Battle of Waterloo need not to be repeated. But if he lost, as it did, the Battle of Waterloo cannot be repeated. So that's a crucial decision. You just make one, once in time. Okay? Well, uh, crucial decisions are important because they generate path dependence. Path dependence is a concept in the social sciences referring to processes where past events or decisions constrain later events or decisions. It can be used to refer to outcomes in a single point in time or to the long-run equilibria of a process. Path dependence has been used to describe institutions, technical standards, patterns of economic or social development, organization behavior, and more. In common usage, the phrase can imply two types of claims. The first, which is the broad concept of path dependence, that history matters. Uh, this means is often articulated to challenge explanations that pay insufficient attention to historical factors. This claim can be formulated simply as the future development of an economic system is affected by the path that it has traced into the past, or particular events in the past can be crucial effects in the future. For example, what did happen if Hitler was killed in 1944? Or in the attempt of 1938, 
There is a man that tried to kill Hitler in Munich by bombing 1938. The world can be completely different. Okay? Well, the second is a more specific claim about how past events or decisions affect future events or decisions in significant or disproportionate ways through mechanisms such as increasing returns, positive feedback effects, or other mechanisms. For economic modeling, path dependence means that learning is impossible. That's, that's very important. If you have path dependence, learning is impossible because the decision environment is changing continuously through time, making impossible for decision maker or even the economist to learn the true model of the economy and thus avoid automatic errors. Uh, and this has very important um, implications for rational expectations, which are the basis of the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models are not good assumptions regarding decision-making behavior. Now it's the most funny part. Well, in, as all you know, in 2008, we had the greatest uh, economic crisis of history since the Great Depression of 1929. And um, one person that I have a profound admiration, which is Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, make the one million dollar question. Uh, she basically was visiting the London School of Economics, the temple of the mainstream economics in Europe. And after some explanations of the professors to the queen, the queen, which was not economist, but a very smart woman said, why did no one see it coming? That was the question Queen Elizabeth famously posed economists in November 2008, just six weeks into the biggest financial crisis in history. On that creation, there is no obvious answer. The world's leading central bank had spent the previous two decades focusing on low inflation, neglecting the risks to financial stability. Now let me present the, the, this video of the Queen Elizabeth. It's very fast. Thank you. 
kualitas. Nah, ada Anybody who is in debt, anybody who really is struggling, they would ask the same questions. It just so happens it was the Queen at the Bank of England. She had a captive audience and the very people that run the economy. So why not ask the questions? In this case, the questions have resulted in a statement from the Financial Services Authority, in which they say, we've widely acknowledged that the regulatory approach before the financial crisis in 2008 was flawed and has since been completely changed. Parliament is now awaiting royal assent for the financial services bill. Like it or not, the Queen isn't just about handshakes and bouquets. What she says carries a lot of value. How much of an impact these comments will have is the million pound question. Harrison Sky News.
Okay, after the Queen's question for economists, uh, I think that's very clear that if economics is a science, it's not a hard science. I think that is very clear. So I'm now using um, uh, an article that Bresser Pereira uh, wrote in 2012 as a lecture to the annual meeting of the Association for Evolutionary Economics that receiving the James Street Scholar for 2012. And the name of the paper is Why Should Economics Be a Modest and Reasonable Science? Economics or political economy, as it was its previous name, is a major social science because it has its object, something that is central to human life. The economic system, how people organize that labor and production, and how they allocate income. In other words, because men and women dedicate a large part of their existence to work and make a living in a market coordinated economic system that economics seeks to understand and explain. Yet economics should be a modest science because, as with all other social sciences, its best models, the models that really make sense, are simple and open, or because its predictive power is limited in so far as, thanks God, men and women continue to be free individuals making choices under uncertainty and according to criteria that are not constant through time. Consequently, economists or policymakers should also be modest and reasonable. They must acknowledge that they have a limited capacity to predict the future. Well, but that is not the case for the mainstream or neoclassical economists. There is the problem of the arrogance of neoclassical economics. What is neoclassical economics? Neoclassical economics is essentially the general equilibrium model, rational expectations, macroeconomics, uh, rational expectation macroeconomics, ne neoclassical growth models, and the theory of efficient financial markets. It's highly abstract and general, but the trade-off was not just between generality and the capacity to deal with a complex and changing historical reality. The kind of cost can, this kind of cost can always be managed by eliminating simplifying assumptions. The real trade-off was between generality and science. The outcome was not scientific models because neoclassical economists adopt inappropriate scientific method. Instead of doing what natural and social scientists are supposed to do, mainly to look for regularities and tendencies in the substantive object of a study, in the case of economics, is the economic system, and to generalize them, neoclassical economists sought it in their uh, army chairs and deduced the whole neoclassical model from the assumption of home economic course and the law of the diminution returns. This methodological choice, the decision to use the development of a substantive science as economics, is a method that is not suited but to the methodological sciences, sciences that have no object but are native to thinking, leads to the construction of an essentially mistaken body of knowledge of an ideological system with, with, without pre predictive power, but with poison consequences, allowing for the assumption of policies and non-policies that just increase inequality and exacerbate the financial stability of economic systems. To the extent that the hypothetical deductive method allow for the building of a precise or mathematical science its practitioners become arrogant, owners of a pure and fully rational science based on the mathematical concept of optimization of Pareto optimality. The more they believe that human beings or economic agents are rational, the more arrogant their economics will be, because the stronger will be their claim to precision, because the more certain they will they of their truthness of their claims. Uh, 
uh, truthless, whose criterion is not correspondence to reality, the correct criterion for so substantive science, but logical consistency, which is the correct criterion for the methodological or adjective sciences. Economics wants to be the queen of social sciences, if not a natural science, because it largely uses mathematics to express its models. Absurdly, for many of its practitioners, models are scientific only when they are formalized, when they are expressed in mathematical terms. In so far as they use a hypothetical deductive method, that is, they use axioms to deduce the theory, the theory is mathematically friendly, but is not science friendly because the deductions that it derives from the assumptions of full rationality are intrinsically and necessarily wrong. Friedman, uh, written, written in 1953, is wrong when he says that we may treat the behavior axioms as if they are true because the predictions derived from scientific method will be correct. On the contrary, predictions are are most of time wrong. They lead to major policy errors and cause major harms. They may be true, but only by accident. Well, as final remarks, in conclusion, a science based on regularities and tendencies is always loose because economic agents are not always rational because they face based uncertainty in decision making, because conventions are institution condition behavior and because economic events are non ergotic, which precludes regularity and provision. The consequence is that economics must be a modest science, a reasonable science, and a pragmatic science. A modest science because its models are not microfunded, mathematical, costless in the air, castles in the air but simple relations that must be permanently checked against reality, a reality whose structure and institutions are permanently changing, and because generalizations are always provisional as uncertainty, as, a, as uncertain as economic behavior. A reasonable science, because men and women are reasonable beings, not purely rational ones. And the pragmatic science, because growth and financial stability are major political objectives of modern democratic societies, and because economics are supposed to make sensible diagnosis of economic and financial problems and to offer reasonably effective policy recommendations to deal with them. Thank you. Uh, Luis, then. Thank you for inviting me again to participate in this meeting. As with the economics, uh, 
couldn't feel from mine and my fingers. A real world problem. So interest. And I will try to continue the discussion of that uh, initiated here brilliantly. Raising some interesting questions when we try to define what is science and try to raise some surpluses related to the term. So the effect of science, the world around us, I will uh, show the economic growth through history, uh, mainly measured by GDP. Here I show you uh, estimates of the GDP per capita from one giga years previous to now, which is a million years in the past, till the year 2000. Uh, the source is given just below this paper, how they explain how he did these estimates. And we see that uh, essentially up to like 10,000 years before common era, uh, the GDP was practically constant. Interaction of man with nature and how he produces some uh, kind of wealth was essentially the same for uh, everyone during all this time. But in 10,000 B, what happened was essentially the beginning of agriculture which we can say was the, you know, the first major technological uh, revolution for humankind. And it caused an increase of population and uh, an increase of uh, wealth production. Uh, and then we have some more or less stable regime with fluctuations which can probably be interpreted as the rise and fall of different empires and political structures of the time and no significant change occur till the 17th century you see the the, the, the GDP per capita it oscillates like between four, uh, is the less to a little more than $100 per capita during this period. In 1990, international dollars. But then, in the 17th century, which is when the scientific revolution began, yeah, so I showed there the, the year when Galileo died and Newton was born in 1642, the same year. And later, in 1776, the introduction of the first efficient steam engine by James Watt. That's why we call unit of energy until today as a the Watt, the same guy. And from the, uh, the 17th century on, we have a very rapid, almost exponential increase of GDP and a less, uh, lesser increase uh, in more recent times. Shows the importance uh, of knowing and controlling the world in a reproducible ma manner. So, what did his machine, every time he needed it to work, it worked, as predicted. 
to, I will return to this point. Here we have the uh, GDP per capita for England, uh, up to 1700, uh, it was for just England in, from this year on for Great Britain. And we see that, uh, that it was more or less constant up to the 17th century, then I marked also the, the same year when Galileo died and Newton was born, 1642. And later we can we see practically an exponential growth until uh, last year, and this graphic is 2016, uh, which is a, a very impressive rapid raise when we compare to the whole time scale of humanity and those that came a little before us. The control of science changed the world around us and it also can be reflected in life expectancy, which is, uh, reflects the quality of life, which is so important. And we, here we have some data about life expectancy uh, for a few countries since uh, the 16th century. Uh, we have more data for the UK in this case, but we have for Japan, South Korea, the whole world, India, Ethiopia, and South Africa, different countries. For all countries, uh, life expectancy started to, to raise by the 19th to 20th centuries. And there are two uh, important discoveries. The first, the, small, the first vaccine developed, which was the smallpox vaccine in 1798, and then a process of pasteurization by Louis Pasteur in 1864. Of course, they, were not, they are not the only discoveries that matter for documentation in life expectancy, but they clearly remark that the production of scientific knowledge also uh, imply some kind of uh, bigger quality of life. And mainly in avoiding child mortality, which is the main factor for having a life expectancy of only 30 years in the past. We will now discuss what uh, try to discuss what we call science and what we call scientific method. So, uh, as I said, the scientific method resulted in an overwhelming increase in quality of life, as we see today, at least for now, because uh, today we start to see some problems in our planet, mainly climate change and ecological problems, some political problems too, that uh, have a tendency to impact negatively the quality of life. We saw recently uh, a huge inundation that affected almost the whole state of Rio Grande do Sul, with, with uh, huge economic impact. So this is just an example of what the future may uh, reserve for us. And I believe that science is even more important now to try to control what is happening to our planet. This, so that's why I see that uh, science resulted in an increase in, in quality of life for now. What will happen uh, next depends on us and depends also on how science will contribute to solve these problems. So science is a guide and the best humanity came up with to navigate through the world around us or even other worlds. Now we go to Mars, to the moon, etc. We send or either humans or machines and the other day, I, I, I see a, a small joke that says that Mars is the only known planet 
that's only inhabited by robots, by machines. But our machines that we send there. And now humanity is so going to other, other worlds. And science is a guide despite many limitations of the human mind. So it's a set of rules that we developed to be capable of uh, understanding the world without falling in pitfalls that our mind creates because of our natural evolution. We are very good at identifying patterns in the, in the nature and we can very easily uh, confuse different patterns as things that they are not. Uh, another important point is that scientific knowledge is always evolving. We, science never has the final truth. Science delivers the best possible truth for the knowledge that we possess at a given moment. And there is always much more unknown to us than is yet known. And each new discovery introduces us to more things that we still don't know and that we would like to discover. And this is why that gives us scientists a job, which is very good. And we can broadly state that science is simply is one thing that is derived from facts. Of course, what is a fact? The huge discussion in philosophy of science, how we know the fact, how we interpret the fact. Of the discussion that came out from the first thing that came with the scientific revolution that initiated with uh, the great minds of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, people like Galileo, uh, Copernicus, Kepler, Tycho Brahe, uh, uh, Paracelsus in medicine, Blaise Pascal, Christian Huygens, and many others. Uh, the majority of these guys uh, were uh, made uh, astronomical observations like in this picture because it uh, was one of the main contributions of Galileo when he turned this uh, telescope that was used to look places around us in Earth, and he turned to the skies to understand the skies, him and other people. So science is based mainly on observation and interpreting and explaining, trying to explain what we observe. Another important point here. Uh, so, Galileo represents what we call now the look, the search for empirical evidence for any theory, any knowledge that we may possess and this empirical evidence must always be, must always have the final word, word in any dispute about what the world really is. Natural science must be capable of making accurate predictions of the future. So we, if I throw a ball in the air, with a given speed in that direction, I can predict exactly where it will fall. Or I can say that uh, uh, two balls, one of one kilo and another one of 10 kilos, if I let them fall from the same height, they will reach the, the floor at exactly the same time. This is the famous Pisa Tower experiment by Galileo. And uh,
Feather, thank you. It's the age of explorer two words. If we elect for a feather and a, uh, a plump ball, of course, then will not reach the floor at the same time because the, we have the air resistance which acts much, much more strongly on the feather. But you can uh, see on the YouTube, there is an experiment done in the United States in a very big vacuum chamber where we, where we extract almost all the air. And then they did this experiment with the feather in a big heavy ball, and they fall exactly the same way and reach the floor at the same time. And this prediction was given by Galileo or or centuries ago, which is and now the question that uh, our discussion: Why it is important to define science properly? But there are many reasons. Uh, the first one is uh, that science uh, help. Uh, he gave, he, he gave the backbones necessary for the industrial revolution that came just after the scientific revolution. There are people usually call the, that say that there are two different uh, industrial revolution. The first one starting in 1760 to 1840, and the second one from 1870 to 1914, with some different characteristics. But it uh, mainly represented the introduction of machines that replaced human labor, uh, a change in the type of production. And the second industrial revolution was mainly marked by any even faster production of new knowledge in technical innovations. So in the 19th century, there is also a, a, a new scientific revolution, let, let us say that with uh, electromagnetic theory, thermodynamics, which was very important to build furnaces in the industry. They studied this a lot, which in the end resulted in new discoveries and new inconsistencies in what we, they saw and what they predicted. Uh, in particular to what we call the black body radiation, which is the, uh, the, the light emitted by furnaces in industry. It didn't follow the, what, uh, what was predicted by the best theory of the time, which was thermodynamics, and resulted in the need to introduce a new uh, more developed theory, which is now called quantum mechanics, which started in the beginning of the 20th, 20th century. So the, this new scientific revolution that I, uh, in some sense uh, lasts until today, have resulted in a very different world. So we can have our cell phones, I can have a map that locates me anywhere on the planet, and even these small, our small cell phones, they, they use quantum mechanics in the transistors, and they use the general theory of relativity to calculate our position, which is required due to the uh, effect of the mass of the Earth that uh, causes a, a change in the curvature of space-time that changes the time of, a, of the uh, arrival of the signals from different satellites to have to do the calculations with it. So we have the most modern science in our pocket, which is something unthinkable a hundred years ago. So it's an, there is an acceleration of production of, of knowledge and industrial development. It, in science, is at the base of, of this, all this. The advent of industrial revolution resulted in the materialization of what we call modern capitalism. 
that again started in England and then spread during this, uh, the, the first industrial revolution and spread to other industrialized nations like continental Europe and the United States. Therefore, science is closely related to the increase in capital and wealth all around the world. And this means social prestige and importance. In a sense, si the word science became a synonym of truth, of scientific truth. And when we say today the word, this is a scientific truth, everyone must say, amen, because this is the word. That's the importance. That is why people want to be called a scientist and his uh, discipline, his field, be called a scientific field, because this gives a prestige, a uh, seal of quality that is much sought by everyone. That's why, and it has a very important social implications also. That's why uh, we scientists must be very careful in, careful in defining what is science. And it's not easy if you look at, uh, at the problem closely. There are many different issues, mainly in soft sciences, but also in hard science. Uh, there are some points that are still in discussion today. So it's a field that is in, can say, in continuous development. So there are many disciplines that emerged in the last two or three centuries, such as sociology, anthropology, political economy, eh, the old name, uh, that each one agreed in some type of methodology to acquire knowledge on different stances of the real world, but without having the same kind of empirical evidence as in natural science. In, in physics, we can make a laboratory, go there, make some measures, and see if these measures are in accordance with a given theory. We can observe the universe and see if the stars, the galaxies, etc., behave as a given theory. If not, we have to change the theory. It's very clear in physics. There are some suppressives, there are some problems, define precisely the etymology of, of science, but uh, in general, it, things are quite well defined. In other fields, it's more complicated because in sociology, how I will make a sociology laboratory unless we have some, um, uh, some kind of alien and I create a humanity and use this as a laboratory of, the, of alien sociologists. Otherwise, it's, it's not possible. Anthropology is also more complicated. I cannot test my theory, but I have evidence. I have evidence in the real world. So this is how I will, I will develop a theory and in some way see if this theory more or less correctly describes what is there. Because that's, again, the most important point. Science is about the real world. It's not just have a, a very well-defined methodology to describe the world that gives up, uh, uh, makes something a science. Otherwise, uh, astrology would be a science. They have a very precise method, and they give very precise predictions. But if you seriously compare their predictions with what really happens, then there's a problem. It's not a science. So you have to, you must have some, some way of comparing what I, I'm saying about the world to what the world really is. And that's a difficult point. I don't know enough economy, but if I predict inflation will be 100% next year, and it is just 1%, you can say that my prediction doesn't work well. But if I say it's 100% and it's 50, maybe there are some other aspects. So 
I left this discussion to the economists themselves, but we must compare what happens, what I predict, what I say, to the real world and see if there is some connection, somehow, some way. Each discipline must precisely give his rules to connect what it says to the world. That's uh, the main point. So science is, the meaning of the word science is socially constructed. It's not devoid of disputes. Okay? Uh, there's a, a very simple example of that. For instance, in the Anglo-Saxon world, usually humanities is not science. It's a field of knowledge, an important one, but they don't call this a science. While in continental Europe and most of the rest of the world, they call we use the word uh, human science. So there are disputes on uh, and the, why it is this there is a dispute because human science doesn't have what we call the experimentation. They put a special accent on this. Uh, an experimentation in defining science, but it's, it's disputable, so. Uh, I, I would read a citation here uh, that says, the categories and concepts of the human sciences are intrinsically vague, many-sided and heterogeneous. Many of the empirical facts on which a forecast might be based such as the stereotyped responses of particular types of individuals in routine situations are essentially hermeneutic. They involve interpretations that goes beyond direct observation and are therefore strongly value dependent. Okay, this is a, uh, can accept or not this, but yes, it's, they touch something of reality. But, nevertheless, it is important to stress that predictive power does not often qualify a uh, knowledge domain in, uh, as scientific. It is not a necessary condition for its social acceptance. So, uh, sociology, for instance, my wife can help me if I say something wrong, uh, Sociology, it's difficult to predict, for instance, if there will be a revolution somewhere. But he can understand the conditions that exist and say, for instance, if it is possible, more possible, not possible. He cannot do precise predictions of the future. He can understand the present, the past, and try to point some issues that can be relevant for the future, which is quite different from physics. You must recognize that a given field uh, can still be very important to all of us, even if it doesn't work as physics. So, again, another citation. The most constructive response to this challenge, to the human science, is to accept the reality of social interests and produce knowledge that acknowledges their existence. But it certainly reduces the practical reliability of research results, especially as a foundation for theoretical prediction, which is the, again the same problem. And also special interest for the discussion today. We can add that, but even economics cannot be made to look just like physics without cutting it adrift from its empirical foundations in suffering humanity. Uh, so, trying to imitate physics uh, uh, in some fields can, in fact, uh, remove what is important in the field. But recognize that some scientific domains are complete, uh, uh, can be science, but of a different kind. It will never be the final incomplete truth let's say, exaggerating a bit. But they offer direction, directions that need some choices. 
I believe in economics, for instance. I can uh, create a theory based on a, a worldview. Simplifying a bit, uh, I, can, uh, I want to help the poor, give money to the poor, have a more, you can say, left wing oriented uh, perception of the world, and try to produce an economic theory that preserves that. Or I can just believe that uh, everyone in the world is responsible for itself, I don't have to help anyone, and build a theory that uh, we must help the rich, and when you have very rich people, this will result in some money going down to the poor. We don't care for the poor. There are many people like this in the world. There are two types. But you must recognize that my theory has a previous choice, and that this choice is an imposition, it's not a scientific truth, and I will side with José Oreiro about the neoclassical people, they say all the time that the, the, the choices they made for their theory are scientific truth. They are only choices. Yeah, possible choices, but not, uh, but there are other choices we can have. So what, finally, what is science? So it's, I can say it's still a work in, process, in progress, mainly for the soft science and but also for hard science, there are some subtle points that are still discussed. And there is no single undisputed broad definition of the word science. It's just a definition of a word that can look at, a, at uh, as in a dictionary, but the choice of the definition has very important uh, consequences, and social consequences, economic consequences. So it varies among countries and communities, as expected from a socially constructed concept. I will give this, as I consider the most poetic uh, definition one has given uh, is by Richard Feynman. Uh, you can see here a famous photo of him that he liked to play bongo. He was a Nobel Prize winner and possibly the most important physicist in the post-war period. Uh, yeah. He said, there was on this planet an evolution of life to a stage that there were evolved animals, which are intelligent. I don't mean just human beings, but animals. We have some previous the Homo sapiens, there are all the hominids, I don't mean just human beings, but animals which can play and which can learn something from experience, like cats. But at this stage, each animal would have to learn from its own experience. They gradually develop. Animal, maybe primates, could learn from experience more rapidly and could even learn from another's experience by watching. Or one could show the other or he saw what the other one did. So he came a possibility that all might learn it, but the transmission was inefficient, and they would die, and maybe the one who learned it died too, before he could pass it to the others. That's the basis of science, what he called and considered science. Even the U US Supreme Court, has his own definition of science. Why? Because when people go to give a testimony in a given process, as a scientific expert. And as I say, science is synonym to truth. So we go to court, the guy can define if one goes to prison or not, or if one dies or not, the American still have death penalty, or one guy pays money to the other or not, and so we must have a definition, what is a scientific expert? 
a legal one. So we see, again, a strong social implication of the definition of science. So this is a definition they gave in 1993 in a case called Dober versus Merrell, which is a company. Science is not an encyclopedic body of knowledge about the universe. Instead, it represents a process for proposing and refining theoretical explanations about the world, world that are subject to further testing and refinement. But in order to qualify as scientific knowledge, an inference or assertion must be derived by the scientific method. Proposed testimony must be supported by appropriate validation. That means good grounds based on what is known. In short, the requirement of an expert testimony pertaining to scientific knowledge establishes a standard of, of evidentiary reliability. So science is reliable and it's based on some kind of validation. So we have some words, also the definition of science require the definition of a few other words, important words. And there are always much discussion, what, what is validation? What is evidence? How we, we see something happening and we see this is an evidence. And a more, I can say, humane, modern and inclusive definition could be, uh, this was given by the Science Council, is an organization in the United Kingdom that uh, gather different scientific organizations. It says, science is the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence. Scientific methodology includes the following. Objective observation, measurement and data, possibly although not necessarily using mathematics as a tool like in social sciences. Evidence experiment and or observation as benchmarks for testing hypotheses. Induction, reasoning to establish general rules or conclusions drawn from facts or examples. For instance, the soul raises every morning, goes down at the end of the day, every day. So I can conclude that next day it will happen and next day and next day it is induction. I generalize a set of observations. If I throw someone through the window and he dies, and I throw a second person from the window and he dies, I can conclude that everyone I, I throw through the window will die. It's also a scientific induction. Uh, repetition, so I can repeat uh, what the, my theory predicts. Critical analysis. And verification and testing, critical exposure to scrutiny, peer review and assessment. Well, peer review and assessment means that science is a social, is socially produced. We do, we do science not as uh, the mad scientist closed in his laboratory. We do it as a community. In the, a given scientific fact to be accepted, it must be accepted by that community not just a single paper that says that eating egg is good or bad, it will constitute a, a scientific fact. But the acceptance of it is good or bad by the whole health community, that, or at least the majority of it, that makes a scientific fact. And this is uh, the comment of uh, guy about this definition, he says, because science denotes such a very wide range of activities, a definition of it needs to be general. It certainly needs to cover investigation of the social as well as natural worlds. It needs the word the words systemic and evidence. And it needs to be simple and short. The definition succeeds in all these respects admirably, and I applaud it, therefore, the definition I gave before. But, of course, you can, can always discuss each point. 
the, as I say, is a social construct. Not everyone will necessarily accept it. There are more radical people and other more open-minded. So some important features of the scientific method. Science is a collective endeavor. Science is a public knowledge. Another interrogation, because this is another po important point, is all the scientific discoveries are not always revealed publicly, because science means money. And we, if I know something that someone else doesn't know, I can make perhaps more money than him. Many times, I have to pay to have this knowledge. And journals, for example. I can pay to have the paper, or I have, uh, sometimes I have to pay a lot of money to publish the paper. That's another question. That's, that's why I put this interrogation point. Its rules are universal. They should apply in any context, any culture, without prejudice. There's uh, also a delicate point because, uh, in fact, what it's saying is that there is no Arabic science or American science or French science or Jewish science. It's just science. Because if the, uh, the rules, uh, they're applied to everyone in the same way, without prejudice. And I, I believe there are some people today that would not agree with that. And of course, there are other types of knowledge. We have scientific knowledge, there are uh, knowledge of uh, different populations, historical populations, knowledge of the past. Uh, and, but, okay, this can be useful, but it must be tested by science to see if it really works. Really, uh, I can't believe that something works. I can give a very simple example. If uh, I pray to win the lottery and believe that it will work, but I can test this. Play to the lottery a hundred times and see how many times I win. Probably not much, but uh, there are different types of knowledge and ways to relate to the world. But science has its rules and it's universal. And it deals with the real, the visible, the palpable world. Also important. There's no science of hell or heaven. It's called another thing, it's called religion, not science. And it must be, be capable to eliminate clearly all pseudoscience and false statements. Many times, people that call itself a scientist, but it is not. Uh, another very contentious point. And I will give you, of course, my own example of what, my own definition of what science really is. Science allows you to send a man to the moon, make him walk out there, him back alive and in one piece. This is science. Every time I want to do that, I can send many people in each time, modulo some accident, it will work. So science works when you need it. Computer is science because when I plug and I can use it every day, not one day or over two or over three. Science works when you need it. That's the point, and that's why it gives the, sand, the industrial revolution. Because when I build a factory, it must work every day, the way it was predicted to work. So well, thank you for your attention. And thank you so much for your presentation, both of you, and please, there are some questions, comments, please, Gabriel. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, one moment, microphone.
just um, uh, two two questions uh, for both of you. Uh, one uh, something that that really bothered me for a long time it still bothers me is the same. Uh, the one in, in, in which he, he said, uh, it doesn't matter the assumptions of the model. You should, you can, and must have very irrealistic assumptions and build the model from those irrealistic assumptions. What is important is that the model helps predict the outcomes. And for me, this was something so strange and so difficult to accept because uh, if you are not worried about the uh, reality or or the uh, capacity of the assumptions to take, you know, to, to abstract real important things of, of, of the reality, you cannot, I think, uh, be able to, to have a, a good one. So this is, uh, to what extent in physics, for instance, this kind of uh, way of working uh, in, in building a model uh, could be uh, accepted? The, the other thing uh, is that science works when you need it. But <laughs> what happens when uh, scientific statements works better for some people and not so well for others in the sense that the impact in terms of power and um, income are very different and this uh, produces a systematic bias in the in the way uh, that a economic statement is uh, regarded by the The last thing, and, and here, uh, is it possible to build a science from purely axiomatic principles? And Questions that. Well, regarding uh, Friedman, his contribution uh, called positive. Uh, methodology for science, I think that is based on a false assumption that we had uh, a way of solve controversies in economics that is perfect. If we have it, I, when I am talking about the, the how controversies are solved in economics, I told you that uh, many controversies in economics are not ever solved uh, because precisely economics lacks what Tarsisio uh, emphasizes in his speech uh, to have a controlled experiment. You know? uh, when the general theory of a relativity of Einstein was formulated, a lot of people are accept skeptic about the theory, because it makes no sense to many people, or to, to, to common sense, which does not make sense. But the theory had a lot of precise predictions that one by one are confirmed by controlled tests, including when men went to the moon. Yes, so forth. So we we had you uh, you can make all any assumption you want if you had a, a, a system of uh, a way to make uh, controlled experiments in which you can say if the hypothesis is correct or not. But this is not the case of economics. And besides that, as a rational man, as a rational scientist. Uh, what's the meaning of starting with hypotheses that I know are, are wrong? For instance, perfect competition. Well, perfect competition is correct for some markets, for instance, for 
a primary goods is, is perfect competition. You have the price that is subtle in international markets. So uh, it's basically given the, the price of soybeans, for instance, is given for each individual soybeans production produ pro producer in the state of Goiás. That's, that's correct. But uh, yeah, perfect competition is not is not a correct and a correct assumption for automobile industries, for uh, electronic industry, for chemical industry, for iron industry, for a lot of other um, sectors of economic activity. So why why I should start uh, with assumptions that I know are wrong? If I do not have uh, a, 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 a system of having a, a, a controlled experiment in which I can uh, conclude if the hypothesis uh, is correct or not, so it's it's for me does not make sense. And what's the second second issue, Gabriel? You made two two issues, two questions. The, the different impact that uh, has have on different uh, groups of people and how it is meant or a common and shared uh, view about the impact of, of the policy. But, well, I think that your question is can be more general than that. Today, in today's society, we have difficulties to define what are the facts that we're talking about. Um, you see, uh, in public discussions, uh, people want to present their own facts. Come on, you can have your own interpretation, but the facts are the facts, right? But uh, it seems that things like that are no longer um, no longer a common base for uh, humans to discuss. And without that, there is no possible civilized discussion. So 10%, uh, I believe, 10% of Brazilian population believes that Earth is flat, independent of its political orientation, right or left. 10% of Brazilian population believes Earth is flat. So oh, that, that's, that's a really a real problem. And just to, to finish my, my answer, of course that economic ideas uh, are not neutral in terms of interests. When you of efficient market hypothesis, what we are really presenting is a thesis about uh, financial liberalization or the idea that the state do not intervene in financial markets. The intervention is bad. Real business cycle theory developed in the 80s uh, said that business cycles is just the rational uh, response of economic agents to technological shocks. So if the government tries to dampen business cycles, it was it, the government just makes things worse than if government do not intervene. Of course, th this had a lot of interest, a lot of economic interests uh, uh, behind that. And just to finish, here in Brazil, the debate over the Selic rate, our basic interest rate. You, last uh, meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee, in which the Policy Committee was divided, uh, four members voted for a reduction of 0.5% of the basic interest rate, another four um, members voted for just 0.25, and then the, the president of the Brazilian Central Bank 
decide for a reduction of 0 0.25. There is a lot of ideological debate between that. Um, the usually, in Brazil, the uh, just uh, reverberates the interest of financial sector. They say that the press say that the four members of the the, the monetary policy committee that voted for a reduction of 0 0.5 was voted because of ideological bias. Well, why not say the same thing about the f other four that voted for a reduction of 0 0.25? What is the, 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 the method that you can use to separate one from another? Because they are, they are more conservative, so they are more serious. It's this, this, this way, you know, you are a staff guy, you know, so they, they are more responsible and they vote for a reduction of just zero. And the others that vote for a reduction of 0 0.5 voted because they are appointed by Lula president. Well, I can say exactly the same for the, the other members of the Monetary Policy Committee. They voted for a reduction of only 0 0.25 because they are appointed by the when, What is the method of saying why this, my statement is wrong and the statement of the financial market is right? What is the method? How can I solve this dispute? That's the kind of things that we do deal with in spirit in economics in Brazil. That's it. Well, I could add a few things. I will start by a question about models. Well, in physics, we love models. Every physicist has built his own model one day. So, but what is a model, at least for us? A model is a simplified version of some piece of the reality. Because dealing with everything in physics that there is in the real world is, can sometimes be very difficult. There's a theory that works, but we have to do very, very complicated calculations or simulations in computers, etc. And have the answer in our lifetime. So we, we build models that have much uh, a simpler version of the world, but that contains some impact. We uh, dismiss some aspects, but retains those that we are interested. And we must always remember this in any model. And of course, a model uh, uh, to, to build this model, I have some assumptions, some previous hypotheses. That must be at least reasonable. Maybe sometimes I cannot prove, but I state that. I have this hypothesis that they, we have to test. And if someone proves that this hypothesis is not good, they uh, can throw away a model. That's it. Okay, that's it. At least for us, it works that way. Uh, and what, what, we can also do models about zombies. There are a few that does this. I have a very interesting book. Uh, but the, the hypothesis zombies exist. But we, of course, every one believes that it's just a, a toy, what you call a toy model, to describe some aspect of reality, which is the transmissions of a, some kind of disease, which in this case would be the virus that infects the, the zombies. But in this model, it retains some aspects of reality, which is transmissions of a virus, and we, we play with that just to, to, see, to see how it evolves and, and try to grasp some knowledge or to illustrate some known knowledge about uh, epidemiological models, for instance. But it's very clear what we, we are doing there. Uh, if I uh, have in economics, you can have a model that we, we cannot prove the hypothesis, but the models work in some limited uh, situation. But we must know that this model can fail at any time, because we don't, since we don't know exactly that 
what is the, the validity of this hypothesis, when it is valid or not. We cannot predict when the model will fail. So it's, uh, I would not uh, bet my life that type of models. It can be, nevertheless, it can be useful. It can more or less explain some aspect of reality, but we must remember that it has its, its limitations. About if it's possible to have an axiomatic scientific theory. Scientific theories are mainly axiomatic, and everyone here knows one example of that, which is laws of Newton. Everyone studied this sometime in school. The laws of Newton's, there are three laws. They are the axioms of classical mechanics. Everything in classical mechanics, which is the mechanics that we use to build buildings and to send them into the moon, are derived from these three very simple axioms. So usually every theory in physics it has these axioms, but those axioms must be somehow tested by reality. So they gave precise predictions. It, it says if I send a man to the moon in this direction with that speed, it will get there. It, if he goes the other direction, oops, the axioms are not correct. That's a, so we must, uh, verification uh, uh, is indirect in this case. We test the consequences of the axioms. And, but in fact, the new, uh, uh, laws of Newton, uh, they can be proved incorrect when you deal with very high speeds, close to the speed of light, and then they must be replaced by what they call the restricted theory of relativity by Einstein. But Newtonian mechanics, classical, are derived from uh, the special theory of relativity or restricted theory of relativity as a particular case valid for small velocities. There are, so they are not invalid, but the theory of relativity just changed the scope of these laws. So also in, in some, you must also assess, given theory, even I think in economics, I believe, you must sometimes, if a given theory fails, say no, this theory, it must be restricted to such and such and such situations that can change with time. Which is quite funny also about Einstein, he, the only variable one knows is that he does won the Nobel Prize by theory of relativity. Because they give the real Nobel Prize only for proved and verified theories. So he, he won for the theory of Brown and motion, which is also an important paper. And he only won only one Nobel Prize. But uh, Every one of the four papers that he published in 1904 merits a Nobel Prize, so he's a very special guy. He's always compared to Newton and Galileo, the three greatest physicists of all time. Just to finish, I would like to say that it's a very controversial statement, but science is neutral, but not the scientist. Science, as a construct, as a set of rules, must be neutral if it is science, because it, it must be universal, at least in an ideal situation. But the scientists are not neutral. Scientists have interests. Scientists love money. Everyone loves money. But everyone is not uh, prepared to do anything for money. That's the difference. And in economics, there are a lot of prestige, power, and money at stake. So this can make the scientists, economic scientists, let's say, to behave in a non-neutral or universal way. Of course. But this is something you must keep in mind. And uh, political implications of economic uh, Theories are huge or so. That means the power that it is what makes the world turn. And this is always a discussion I want to say. People say, no, okay, that's science, not real. I prefer to separate the word science that we discussed here 
from this uh, a way of knowing with a set of rules to knowing the real world, and that's made by scientists that can fail. They can publish fake papers, they can do fake statements, and uh, such as that. We know many examples of that. But the problem is not science, it's the, the guy that call, calls himself a scientist. Hope to have answered the, the question. We have to finish. I don't know if there are some other questions or comments. No? Our presentations. Uh, and uh, in uh, next, in ten minutes, we will start the next section. Okay, ten minutes just to go to the bathroom, take some water. In ten minutes, okay.